If the banking crisis emerges elsewhere, which it is bound to do, it won't be long before we have a real banking crisis in the Eurozone, in my opinion, uh, then the knock-on effects of that will mean that central banks like the Fed, um, uh, Treasury departments like the US Treasury, will then consider taking stakes in the major banks in order to keep the banking network sound. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly directly at 419-819-9209 or my sons and fellow brokers at 310-562-6400 or 419-490-5295 or email us kaiser at milesfranklin.com. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest, the head of research at goldmoney.com, Alistair McLeod, joins us this Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. Alistair, thanks for coming back on. It's my pleasure, DK. We've got to talk with you about some important forces that are really set to, uh, I guess you could say, upset the apple cart. We've got both uh, the potential for increased bond yields that have been uh, trying <laughs> at various times to increase, and perhaps yield curve control in one form or another has been keeping that tamped down. We also have inflation that's been denied by some including most in officialdom, and yet is evident, according to many, in the commodities markets, among other sources. So we'd like to get your take on both of those. And then we'll have time for some viewers' questions, uh, we, we hope. So could you first kick us off with your concerns around why, if bond yields increase now, it could be particularly seriously impactful to the stocks and other equity markets? Yes, sure. I think there's a general assumption that uh, the Fed is in control of both interest rates and bond yields. Um, but we have seen uh, the 10-year US Treasury yield actually bottomed out um, in March 2020 at just under half of a percent. It's currently, it ran up to 1.7%. I think it's currently around about 1.58 or something like that. So what we have seen is we have seen a move up in bond yields, um, which has been ignored by equity markets. Equity markets have gone on from strength to strength while these bond yields have recovered. Now, you could argue that the recovery in bond yields followed a period of real concern uh, about the potential for deflation, because you may recall that early in 2020, I think from around about um, the first week in February to mid-March, the S&P actually lost a third uh, of its value. I mean, it was a, a real fall. And we saw other things fall as well. Uh, commodity prices went down, so on and so forth. That was the famous COVID crash where the world was falling apart. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I th the concerns then, I think, could be summed up as, um, you know, this COVID problem um, was likely to crash the economy. And uh, so fears of deflation, if you like, uh, began to dominate um, in financial asset valuations. That has moved by. Um, that is no longer the main concern. We are now emerging, hopefully, from uh, lockdowns and there won't be any more. There's still some countries lagging in this, um, worryingly some in Europe as well. But um, we're now moving on and we're now looking for, um, uh, if you like, uh, uh, the pent up savings over the lockdowns beginning to be spent. Um, now, this is causing some concern because, I mean, even people like Larry Summers um, and Paul Krugman, um, who are arch inflationists, are saying that, um, you, know, you know, perhaps this, you know, the, the strength of the economy could actually mean that prices rise and it could force a rise in interest rates. Um, 
we had uh, a sort of a bit of a flip-flop with Janet Yellen, um, who I think slightly misspoke, I think is, is the term that you use in America when an official says something he or she should not have said. Um, and there has been, a so if you like, a sort of a backing off from the idea that uh, the Fed might have to raise interest rates. But you can see that this is a concern. Um, my uh, very long experience of markets, I mean, going back to 1970, I've watched the cycle of, of bull and bear markets. And the one thing that I have observed, and others I'm sure have observed as well, is that um, when a bull market is very, very mature, what tends to happen is that bond yields start rising. Why do they start rising? They start rising really because um, uh, bond markets are beginning to anticipate that the low interest rates that you have towards the um, uh, end of a recession are about to turn round and there's going to be demand for money picking up and you're going to see higher interest rates as the economy recovers. So you find that bond yields start rising while equities are themselves also rising because equities are driven by the better economic prospects, which all the analysts uh, can see. And there's, there's usually there's corporate activity going on. Companies are beginning to uh, go out and take over other companies. Uh, so, you know, all this sort of money begins to go into equities towards the end of the equity bull market. But what does for the equity bull market is not um, suddenly um, a deterioration in uh, the outlook for profits, but um, that second rise that inevitably you get in bond yields. So, um, you know, the first one, if you like, is the warning sign, which, uh, you know, nobody pays any attention to. But the second one causes everybody to sit back and think, now, hold on a minute. Uh, bond yields are rising. This is not good for equity valuations. So you can see that um, the development of that second rise in bond yields is enough to turn a bull market top into the early stages of a bear market. Now, if you look at the, uh, uh, the yield on the US Treasury, um, it's risen from 0.48, which was the actual low of a percent, up to around about 1.7. It's been backing and filling a bit over the last month or so. Um, it's finding support around about the 55-day moving average. I don't know if that matters, but you can see that after this pause, now that some very serious people are beginning to look at the inflationary implications of the unleashed demand that we now expect uh, from post lockdowns, you can see that we are moving into that very dangerous territory where the equity market is going to be undermined by a second rise in bond yields. Now, how far is it likely to go? I think that um, if you look at the Fed's expectation, and that is that uh, price inflation will overshoot somewhat. Um, this year, but then they expect it to come back to normal. You're looking at um, a, a yield on uh, something like a like the 10 year US Treasury, which must be a minimum of about two and a half percent. So um, it's got some way to go up to there. And why should it stop there? I mean, if we actually look at what's going on in the economy, uh, the capacity to expand production to meet this uh, wave of demand, unleashed demand, is actually very, very limited. It's limited in, in uh, the sense that um, many, many industries are just not in the position to produce the extra product uh, to meet this demand. And uh, one very good example of this is the food industry. I mean, if you look at um, agri products, we've seen two things. We've seen um, that farmers can't get it, you know, can't get the the employees uh, to go and pick crops, to look after cattle, whatever, whatever. Um, and in fact, I saw, I think someone tweeted a farmer's sign, um, you know, offering a $500 upfront payment if you come and work at the farm. I mean, there is desperation, if you like, for uh, that human resource, which is desperately important when it comes to food production. I think um, uh, the other problem, of course, is that if you look at the prices of the raw materials, the raw commodities going into the food chain, I mean, they're all up through the roof. 
So um, th the idea that the, the, the staples in life are only going to go up to two and a half percent is obviously completely wrong. And that's unfolding as we speak. And if you look at the broader commodity con uh, uh, context, we've got exactly the same thing. Commodity prices have absolutely rocketed since March 2020, when the Fed went all in with 120 billion a month of QE and, all, and zero interest rates and all the rest of it. So we have something which is likely to drive prices a lot higher, principally because you have got this uh, um, consumer demand being unleashed, bolstered by helicopter drops, um, and at the same time, you just haven't got the product to satisfy it. And worse, um, in the past, uh, America has been able to import things um, from China. But what's happened to the supply chains? They're a complete mess. And if you talk to people in the logistics industry, um, they will tell you that this isn't going to get sorted out overnight. Um, it's likely to consider to persist all the way towards the year end and then um, probably beyond there so you can see that you've got a supply chain issue which um, needs to be considered as well as the pure lack of product I mean this is um, going to drive prices up it's as simple as that now why do prices rise they rise because all the money has been printed to permit them to rise so what does the Fed do at some stage, it's going to turn around and say, hold on a minute, we're sacrificing the dollar because in terms of commodities, in terms of the cost of everything, the dollar's purchasing power is not only beginning to fall at an accelerated rate, but that rate will accelerate further. We've got lots of precedent for this. And if you just sort of have an understanding of what inflation really is, um, its origin basically being the excess production of money and credit, then you can see that this is going to happen. So at some stage, uh, the Fed is going to have to reconsider its policy of suppressing interest rates at the zero bound. And it will also have to reconsider possibly uh, suspending QE or reducing the rate of QE, simply because as long as it continues on these current policies, it undermines the purchasing power of the dollar even further. So they're likely to back off, to be forced to back off by markets, if you like, from its current monetary policies. Now, when it does that, um, I mean, the QE of 120 billion a month is what is driving equity markets. It is also keeping bond yields suppressed to a degree. And here I'm referring to corporate bond yields rather than U.S. Treasury yields, because what the Fed is doing is it is buying U.S. Treasuries off pension funds and insurance companies and encourage them, encouraging them to invest in more ris risky assets. And those are corporate bonds and equities. So the feed of money going into um, these institutions is likely to diminish. Now, when that happens, you can see another reason why equity markets uh, could be actually hit rather badly. And also the corporate junk, uh, you know, the sort of the junk bond markets and the corporate bond markets are likely to be hit as well. So um, what we're seeing at the moment, I think, is potentially the top of the market, the top of financial um, non-fixed in interest uh, financial assets are likely to peak out in the next month or so, maybe two months, I don't know. I'm not going to give an idea on timing. All I'm talking about are the dynamics behind it. There is a wind of change blowing through markets, and we must be aware of that. Hmm. This is fascinating. And some of the, the causal linkages that you just described as far as, you know, when the Fed is buying what type of bonds and that makes capital have to go chasing yields elsewhere you know that's not obvious to the ordinary the ordinary person but it's very fascinating one of the things that came out in what you just described was this it just keeps hitting me as this set of ironies and contradictions to to i guess conventional logic we've got record unemployment in the sense of 40 to 50 million unemployed they they've they've changed the way that they count unemployment because it just the numbers got so big uh, you've got businesses failing, the, the generational uh, uh, small businesses that are, that are failing, and yet you've got 
uh, people unwilling to work. So employers that are operating are desperately trying. We've we've reported on a, to a, a different interview. We just came back from travels across the U.S. and through uh, some rather impoverished uh, areas in in the central uh, southern states. And signs up on fast food restaurants who can't open their dining rooms because they don't have enough staff to work saying, you know, uh, high rates and, and bonuses to sign on and stuff. So you've got employers begging for uh, the employers that are that are still in business begging for the people who <laughs> evidently aren't working but don't want to go back to work. And then you've got those who are working seeming to be just overloaded. We've had repair people, uh, appliance repair people, nurses, others just saying that there's just they're just inundated with the workload they cannot keep up so it's it's just this these contradictions and then further uh, we've got some people saying you know no inflation visible yet the way the fed measures it and yet in the u.s where people are where houses are being built because of urban flight out of urban areas to uh, more liberty loving areas appliances months and months on black back order that kind of thing it's you say not obvious to many who are observing the financial world that I believe, but to ordinary people on the streets, it's it's even more, I think, confusing and bewildering because we get these strong cross currents and, and conflicting signals. Uh, but amid that whole cacophony, you're saying that we need to be aware that you're seeing a second wave of likely bond yield rates rising that's likely to cause this time, when it didn't the first time, a really significant impact in, in markets. Uh, stock markets and uh, equity markets. It's interesting because Michael Pento, who's also been on our channel, was says he's been watching for a turning point mid-year here. He said, don't pin me down, whether it's you know May, June, July, but he said, but it's coming. And, uh, and it's interesting that he said, watch out for an interest rate spike. I'm hearing the same thing from you. Can you talk to us about the impact on uh, precious metals one way or the other if you see one or what has historically been a correlation at times like this? Yes, certainly. Um, I think the best example is to go back to the 1970s when we had inflation really uh, took off. And um, for some of your younger viewers, uh, it was that decade where we saw um, price inflation rising at rates of between 15 and 20 percent in some years. It followed the um, end of the Bretton Woods, uh, the Nixon shock um, in at the beginning of the decade, uh, which basically uh, meant that um, the, well, particularly the American government um, could produce um, money, if you like, out of thin air. And this was, uh, this was all part of trying to deal with the oil price shock. Um, the oil price shock led to a rapid expansion of the quantity of money. And so prices followed. But if you looked at the one-year U.S. Treasury bond yield as a proxy, if you like, for the cost of money, which it equates to more or less, uh, it started that, that decade at a yield of just under 6%. At the same time, gold was $35 an ounce. By the end of the decade, um, that uh, yield had risen to, uh, I think from memory, something like 13 percent, something like that, having been a bit higher. Um, and the price of gold had gone up to um, well over $500 an ounce. I, it subsequently went on to 850 on one, one fix, but that was just after the end of the decade. So the idea that um, uh, higher interest rates are bad for gold uh, basically is not the case. And certainly from the middle of the 1970s, um, the price of gold actually went up uh, at the same time as uh, the one-year U.S. Treasury bond yield. I mean, you know, they were they were in sync. Um, now, the the reason for this um, to sort of help try and understand it is is there are two aspects of of understanding the problem. The first is that people think that gold doesn't have an interest rate. But when they say that, they're actually comparing physical gold in my hand, as it were, or your hand, with, um, you know, a hundred dollar note in your hand. Neither pays any interest at all. But if instead of a US, you know, a hundred dollar note in your hand, uh, you have it 
uh, on term deposit at a bank, you will earn some interest, or at least you did until, <laughs> until back they, when interest was the thing. Yeah, until they did away with interest. But um, so you know that money has interest in exactly the same way. If you know, I can lend my gold. Uh, out to someone else who wants it because they want to deliver it in the market or whatever. The central banks do this all the time. So um, the point about interest rates, it's not that gold doesn't have an interest rate. It does have an interest rate. It's just that it's very different from the interest rate on paper money. The paper money interest rate reflects the fact that it doesn't have uh, the stability of gold. So you will find you've got two completely different rates of interest the interest rate on gold tends to be somewhat lower than the rate of interest on um, on, on a paper currency. So that's, that explains that bit. Now, when we come to the market in the 1970s, uh, what happened was that um, the market took control of pricing of uh, bonds um, and, uh, in effect, interest rates as well. Um, and it took it away from the central banks. So what happened was that the central bank, and this is a lesson for um, you know the the rest of this year, central banks were reluctant to put up interest rates, but the markets, in order to fund um, uh, uh, you know governments to buy government debt and all the rest of it, markets refused to buy government debt at the levels which the central bank thought um, the market should uh, buy them. Uh, buy them at. So because they suppressed the yield, nobody was buying the debt. So what happened was that the gold price sort of seeing this would rise and discount what in, in, in effect is, um, if you like, a, a funding crisis. Eventually, what happened is that the central bank reluctantly begins to raise interest rates because they can't do any funding at these, you know, at the sort of suppressed levels. But it's not enough. And when the central bank is on the run, um, markets are absolutely ruthless. They can see that the central bank is on the run and they anticipate yet higher rates. So what you get is you get a rise in the yield of very short term uh, US treasuries and treasury bills reflecting uh, the fact that uh, markets are in control of interest rates. And this is something which central banks absolutely abhor. And this is why the only way in which this um, uh, charade was uh, terminated was when Volcker turned around and said, right, we're going to bang up interest rates to 20 percent. And at that level, um, you know, if you were a gold bull, you had a decision to make. Uh, you know, were you tempted to take 20 percent, <laughs> if you like, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of prime rate or the equivalent of a prime, prime rate, um, or were you going to stick with your gold uh, stored somewhere, probably not producing anything because you didn't want to lend it to anyone? Um, you know, so what were you going to do? At 20%, um, it was enough, if you like, to break the, um, the, that inflation cycle. And once that was broken, then central banks began to to regain control over uh, over interest rates. So that was the lesson of it. So rising interest rates under those circumstances are a clear signal that, um, you know, gold is, is going higher and it is going to continue to go higher. It will drag up the rates at that time. And that is why uh, we ended up with um, gold moving from 35 bucks to over 500 bucks over the decade, while at the same time, interest rates more than doubled. This is fascinating. And I think that a lot of these lessons have been lost on the most people these days. You know, our attention span is, is dreadfully short these days. You've talked recently about the risk to the fiat currency itself at times. Uh, and we have a question here from Hans P who says, what is the practical consequence to one's mining stocks investments if fiat disappears? Well, uh, it, it, that's a very good question. I, I don't give investment advice. So I must make that clear from the outset. No, he's just asking, I think, a pr in principle, for someone who is a holder of mining stocks, what is the impact to such a holder of a mining stock when the fiat currency goes through a crisis? Well, you will find that your shares priced in fiat currency will reflect the collapse of the um, purchasing power of the fiat currency. So, 
um, in, in inflationary times, um, mining stocks are very, very good things to have. Um, it is different from gold because gold is the ultimate protection and silver, I suppose, is sort of um, you know, in the same category. It is the ultimate protection against uh, um, uh, weak money policies. And But um, if you look at, um, you know, throughout history, the history of gold mining, you find that mines and not only gold mines, but, uh, you know, mines, general metal mines, copper mines and all the rest of it actually perform pretty well because all these things um, – are effectively hedges, if you like, against inflation. I mean, that's what we're seeing now in commodities. The copper price has gone through the roof over the last 12 months. Why? Because people like the Chinese realize the dollar's going down. So from their point of view, they would rather hold copper stocks than dollar stocks. And if they'd pursued that policy, they would have done extremely well. So you can see that, you know, it's not just confined to gold and silver. Um, another way of looking at the relationship between gold and silver and commodities is that over the very, very long term, the price of commodities is stable measured in gold. I mean, for example, if you look at the price of oil um, in the early 70s measured in gold, it's not too far away from where it is measured now. Um, I haven't actually done the sums, but you'll find that it's certainly a lot less volatile than priced in dollars. And that's a very important point to bear in mind. So um, we can broaden, if you like, uh, the answer to the question to include other commodities as well. If you own if you own mining stocks or commodities and the fiat goes completely bust, do we have precedent to know where, where that leaves you, how, how you emerge from that? What do you still own when the fiat goes away? OK, when, when that happens, um, uh, let us assume for the sake of argument that um, uh, the central banks move from fiat currency to um, some backing by gold. And let us assume that that works and it is and, and the purchasing power of the currency is stabilized. In effect, the price of your gold uh, of your gold mine shares will then be priced through the medium of um, a gold substitute. In other words, let's say dollars at the rate of 100,000 an ounce or whatever the figure works, works out at, it will be priced in gold. Um, and uh, I mean, such an investment is more likely to survive that inflation catastrophe than an ordinary industrial investment. Um, when you look at what happened in Germany in 1923, which everybody refers back to, the big difference between then and now is that uh, in those days, other currencies were sound because they were tied to uh, gold and particularly the dollar. So the dollar retained its purchasing power in Germany. In fact, its purchasing power went up because it was demanded. Companies in Germany which um, uh, manufactured for export and earned dollars and pounds and so on, um, and Swiss francs, um, they did pretty well out of this because their costs were being devalued. Their, you know, their domestic costs were being devalued, uh, while at the same time, uh, measured in the local currency, um, their earnings, you know, their, they were going through the roof because they were earning dollars or pounds or whatever it was. So that was the situation then. But this time round, what we're looking at is a complete collapse potentially a complete collapse of paper currencies. There is no sound paper currency if the dollar becomes toast. So it's a very different situation. The only thing that you can possibly have to uh, protect yourself is physical gold. And as your questioner, Hans, I think it was, um, sort of effectively is pointing out with his, his, his question, um, uh, you know, the investments that you would have should be concentrated on the production of gold, silver, and maybe some of the leading metals. And food as well, that's another thing. I mean, the other thing is, 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 is farmland. We really want to broaden it. I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, in Europe in the 1920s, early 1920s, we had hyperinflation in Germany, Austria, Poland, and Hungary. We had four countries. There was a block there with hyperinflation. Now, this meant that foreigners were able to walk in and just pick up country estates for no money at all. I mean, literally. And writers uh, at that time covering the period sort of felt that, you know, these foreigners were absolutely robbing, um, you know, Austrians and Germans of 
Yeah, they were just, you know, taking advantage of them. Um, and that is interesting because uh, the prices in gold were um, substantially reduced as a result of the conditions brought about by hyperinflation. I mean, you know, a house in Berlin, I think I've said this on your show before, house in Berlin, you know, a good six bedroom house, a fashionable part of Berlin, 1923, costs you 100 bucks. How many grillions of uh, paper marks? I would have no idea at all. But you can see how the thing changes. It's, it's mostly the collapse of the local currency that does it. But the purchasing power of gold and silver at the same time rises because it reflects the demand for them measured in commodities, uh, non-financial assets and so on and so forth. Along the, the basket of contradictions and mysteries that we're facing right now, uh, Larkoval says, how is the banking system still holding together with all the mortgage deferrals in the world? <laughs> um, that's, yeah, <sighs> this is a difficult one to answer. I think the I think the answer is that um, certain central banks, and I would say the ECB, is turning a blind eye to what is actually going on in the commercial banking system. We know, and it's not just me, um, this was actually worked out by um, the head of the Bundesbank, who wrote a stiff letter to the ECB saying, um, we don't like this. Uh, we know that bad debts are being uh, shuffled up from the national level into the target to settlement system. And the result is that Germany uh, is now owed over a trillion euros, uh, while um, countries like Italy and Spain and Greece, basically they owe the money to the Bundesbank. And a lot of it is bad debts. So... There is a protection racket going on, I think, between certain central banks and their commercial banking networks. They would rather hear no evil, see no even evil, say no evil. And, uh, you, you know, if, if you look at the statements coming out of the ECB, I mean, that actually describes what they're saying about the whole thing. I mean, it is just extraordinary. As far as um, the American banking system is concerned, the large banks um, have protected themselves slightly because they are now reducing their exposure to um, uh, bank credit into the non-financial economy. They've reduced this um, uh, over the last 10 years from about 61%, and I think it was about 61% at the beginning of March last year. Uh, sorry, 71%, it's now down to 61%, which means almost 40% of the bank balance sheet is doing other things. And guess what? They're buying bonds and you know, doing sort of dealing in financial financial things, basically. So um, the the other thing about the American banks is that they are less highly leveraged than most of the other banking systems around the world, which is a very good thing. I calculate that they're around about 11 times uh, their uh, capital. I'm looking particularly, particularly at the big banks, the global systemically important banks. They're around about 11 times. Now, that is high, um, but it's not high compared with the Eurozone, which is over 20 times. It's not high compared with the UK, which is over 16 times. It's not high compared with Japan, and it's not high compared with China, which is almost on uh, Eurozone levels. Um, but nonetheless, um, if you're an, um, uh, an American bank and you have to write off 10% of your balance sheet, it wipes out your equity. So I think what we're likely to see is central banks coming up with more innovative ways to support the uh, commercial banking system. And um, I think they will guarantee further bank credit to non-financial customers you know, put in guarantees so that the bank is not on the hook sort of thing. And I wouldn't rule out if the banking crisis emerges elsewhere, which it is bound to do. It won't be long before we have a real banking crisis in the Eurozone, in my opinion. Uh, then the knock on effects of that will mean that central banks like the Fed, um, uh, Treasury departments like the US Treasury 
will then consider taking stakes in the major banks in order to keep the banking network sound. So there are things that they can do. Um, you may not like the sound of it, but when their backs are up against the wall, they will do it. And I'm sure that this is one of the things that is driving central bank digital currencies, because that bypasses the commercial banking network completely. What's the meaning of the Fed taking a stake in banks if the Fed is is actually constituent, all of its members are already bankers? Are they just buying interest in their own their own selves? Well, yes, it, it, it could be the Fed. More likely, it would probably be the U.S. Treasury that would take take the stakes, um, and uh, you know, and the Fed would regulate the whole thing, sort of thing. Um, but uh, I mean, you, you know, the whole system basically is corrupted, and um, you know, the idea that banks actually work um, for the economy and they're just a pass through. You know, they're, they're, you've got depositors on the one side and you've got borrowers on the other side. That is complete rubbish because deposits don't actually exist. There is no such thing as a deposit. What there is, is a liability of the bank to you having taken your money or, um, you know, it's, it's not a deposit at all. It is, it, you know, it is, it is a loan, if you like. Uh, you have made a loan. If you've got money in the bank, you have loaned it to the bank. It's not a deposit at all. And they are created um, at the same time as the bank creates credit. I mean, you know, what happens is that, um, you, you know, you, you, you create, um, uh, if you like, the sort of a, a loan to someone. Now, that appears as an asset on one side of the bank's balance sheet, but it's got a balance. So what they do is they create the deposit on the other side. So you go into your bank and uh, you persuade the bank manager to lend you some money. As you go out of the door, he will say, well, Mr. Kaiser, we've now credited your account. You can draw it down anytime you want. Why is that? Because there are two sides of the balance sheet. And under banking law, it's quite simple. The moment you create the, um, uh, the loan, you also create a matching deposit. None of these deposits actually originated from anywhere else other than that process. So uh, the vested interests of banks are completely different from the idea that they are the way they're regulated, even as sort of pass through operations, you know, where um, you've got, you know, depositors on one side and you've got um, uh, borrowers on the other side and the bank is merely an intermediary. No, it's, it's a creator. So you've got a system which actually um, is not capable of handing, handling um, a real banking crisis. Um, and not only that, but the banks just don't have uh, uh, the motivation, if you like, to go along with what the Fed says. I mean, if the Fed turns around and says, do this, do that, the banks say, well, I mean, just imagine um, if, let us say, the Fed, uh, and this is not impossible, turns around and says, uh, OK, the, the, the economy looks like it's recovering, but we don't like the trend in bank credit going out to manufacturers. The manufacturers are not getting the money in order to manufacture a product to sell to consumers. We better get the banks in and tell them that they've got to start lending to to uh, the non-financial sector. So around to the Fed and you get you know people like Jamie Dimon and all the rest of them, you know, they listen to what the Fed says. And then afterwards, you can guess the conversation. Well, if the Fed called us in, they must be worried. So what do we do? We go back, mm, just go easy on the, loan, on the loans, <laughs> you know, no new loans because, because we're a little bit concerned. And this is, you know, this is, this is the whole thing. I mean, this has happened before. It happened under Hoover. Um, you know, Hoover called in all the, all the banks and said, you know, we've got to get this economy going. I mean, we're talking about uh, sort of, just after the Wall Street crash. And uh, the bankers went out and did exactly the opposite because they could see that, um, you know, they would go bust if they, if they did what Hoover suggested. And it's exactly the same today. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed at all. Well, Alistair, we've got more questions than we'll be able to field today. 
We're always grateful for your time with us and for giving us insight into what's going on inside the banking system. It's completely opaque to most and your history of being involved within the banking system and your years and decades of analysis of it afterwards are extremely helpful to our guests. If people want to find your work, where should they get uh, connected with your writing? I write an article every Thursday, which is published, I suppose, sort of late morning, early afternoon EST. Um, and you find it on goldmoney.com, hit the research tab and insights. And that's where that is. And I also write a market report published on the following day, Friday. Um, and that's just ahead of the weekend. And you'll find it in, in, you know, under the same research tab. And folks, so that you don't lose track of any of our interviews with Alistair and all of our other guests and any links to articles or other research and resources they provide, make sure you get on our free mailing list at libertyandfinance.com. Go over in the left-hand margin once you get to libertyandfinance.com, put your name, email address, and subscribe. Where you confirm the uh, email confirmation that comes your way, you're in, and you'll get that at least three times a week with all of our guests. Alistair, on behalf of all of our viewers, we just thank you for joining us this time again on Liberty and Finance. That's my pleasure, DK. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded for physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality, pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin, satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my sons and fellow brokers at 310-562-6400 or 419-490-5295 or email us, Kaiser at milesfranklin.com.